Pretty recently, I remembered that I'd really loved reading Skip Beat as a teen. I'd watched all of the anime and kept up with the manga all the way until the heel sibling arcs, for the very obvious reason that due to the fact that Kyoko was acting as Ren's sister for the arc, their romance now had a tendency to feel very strange and unpleasant, as Ren gave her no help at all in telling acting from reality. However, my nostalgia let me power through this and then go back to the regular arcs that happen after it, and Skip Beat showed me that while some of its jokes from 10 years ago have aged a bit badly, the story hasn't. Kyoko is still a brilliant female lead. The story is still full of color and fun. The recent arc, because Skip Beat is still ongoing, has introduced a lesbian character into the story. This was a fun trip down memory lane, and mostly made me joke about Kyoko still being a better character, and in fact, better villainous archetype, than most of the villainous manga and manhwa that I now tend to read as my main interest in the shoujo genre. So, have shoujo main characters changed significantly in personality and portrayal over the course of the last couple of decades? If Kaicho wa Maid-sama was being created today, would the author have made the same choices in who Misaki was, where she worked, and what she wanted in a boyfriend? Toru from Fruits Basket 1998 was, in fact, updated in the 2019 anime remake. The anime didn't want to show her to be as focused on doing housework in exchange for her living arrangement the way that the original manga and anime did. Sawako, Sakura, and Nanami are considered the ideals of shoujo romance by many due to how they are portrayed and in how they act with kindness, charm, and modesty. And a 2020 listicle compared them extremely favorably to the heroine of Wolf Girl and Black Prince, which notably complained about her not having any self-worth as her most annoying trait. Now, having watched Wolf Girl and Black Prince, I can say with confidence that lack of self-worth is not even in the running for her most annoying trait. But I find that endearing, not off-putting. However, Erika does represent something interesting. Her manga went into publication in 2013, anime greenlit in 2014, around the same time as the villainous shoujo subgenre really got started in Japan. Was that an especially good year for shoujo heroines to break the mold? Honestly, no. As I went over in my previous video, many shoujo heroines placed in the position of an otome game villainess are put there to more openly show their inherent good nature and kindness. Placed in a position where it would be easy to be cruel, they instead work hard to make sure that good things happen to the people around them. Katarina of My Next Life and Iris of Common Sense of a Duke's Daughter both go extremely far out of their way to attempt to make the world their own definition of a better place. Preventing bullying and insecurity in Katarina's end, while Iris's large-scale approach lean towards founding an orphanage. Earlier stories, like The Daughter of the Albert House Wishes for Ruin and Vengeful White Cat Plots Revenge, Despite their titles, follow that mold to a T. The main characters only do good deeds and try their best to make the people around them happy, even at great personal cost. Thus, the popularity of the villainous genre had yet to break any genre standards in terms of the expectations of a who a shoujo lead should be. In fact, in many ways, Iris and Katarina were more traditionally shoujo than someone like Kyoko, who frequently wishes ill on the people around her, or Yona of Yona of the Dawn, a privileged princess who finds herself torn from her position and ends up a battlefield leader. So let's look back even further. Sailor Moon was first published December 28, 1991. Usagi, considered by many to be the basis for many of the shoujo characters that came after her, is a klutz. She can't cook, she doesn't clean, she's stylish but never the most fashionable person in the room, she doesn't keep up with current trends, she has bad grades, difficulty concentrating on studying, and she has no sense of direction. 
I mentioned to my friends upon watching the show that after she marries Mamoru in the future, she will likely never want to hold a job, and she's also unlikely to do any housekeeping. Mamoru will be doing everything solely for the privilege of being married to her. Of course, the thing is, he does consider that a privilege. Why? Well, because even though Usagi isn't selfless in her day-to-day life, or even in most of her grand adventures, her core principle is that everyone in the world deserves to be listened to, offered trust, and saved, even if that trust is not reciprocated. She's also simply a great friend. He's got steep competition from others who'd gladly do all that and more for the honor of having Usagi in their life. It's difficult, however, to draw a direct correlation between Usagi and the more modern heroines without also looking at a manga that came out the year after Sailor Moon premiered, Boys Over Flowers. Tsukino is a humble, hard-working girl from a middle-class family whose mother enrolls her in an elite high school. There, she meets the Flower Four, Four guys who first bully her for standing up to them, and then bully her because they have a crush on her. It's impossible to overstate how formative Boys Over Flowers was for both the Otome game template and for the various iterations of the reverse harem romantic comedies that would follow after it. While Sailor Moon set about establishing the magical genre into the titan of the modern market, equally popular to the ascension it had been inspired by, Boys Over Flowers was here to provide the exact look of what all high school reverse harems would be for the next, oh, 30 years? Nowhere is that more obvious than in the genre classic or in High School Host Club, a manga that came out in 2002, which follows Boys Over Flowers' general template beat for beat except for where its later tone demands that the rule of comedy make everything more extreme. Haruhi's not middle class, she's dirt poor and on a scholarship. The boys aren't just the top of the school in terms of looks and money, they run a host club. Oren doesn't have four male leads, it has six, neatly divided into actually relevant and those guys. Rose Bridges, who wrote an article on this for Anime News Network back in 2015, drew attention to the fact that Oren High School Host Club's anime adaptation was largely written by Yoji and Okido, the same mind behind the Utena Revolutionary Girls writing in its anime. While not being the type of work easily cloned or used as anything other than an acknowledgement of how it acts as a reflection and deconstruction of the shoujo genre, the 1997 Utena anime also made its own footprint in the shoujo genre's trajectory as Enokido continued with his perspective of the lack of value in a shoujo male lead's princehood and imprinted it into Oren, the rose motif that had been used straight in Sailor Moon and then deconstructed in Utena, now used for farce in his new comedy. Interestingly, that perspective combined with Oren's already established habit of satirizing its own genre resulted in what Bridges called the origin of the Fujoshi Bait show, with the author acknowledging the influence from Fruits Basket's popular collection of background male characters that exist to be inviting to female characters on a level separate from romantic projection. Oren High School also had one other major factor, Haruhi. In a move that was extremely transgressive in 2002, and unfortunately still seems to be kind of transgressive 20 years later, one of Haruhi's characterization beats was being a person who felt a disconnect between herself and her gender. Many of Oren's jokes and character beats have aged incredibly poorly over time, but Haruhi's specific characterization hasn't. Perhaps her most major transgression of all is her own contentment with who she is and how much she felt suited to male or androgynous clothing, no matter the circumstance. That same year of 2002, Skip Beat also began publication. It was a good year for shoujo. Kyoko is an unbelievably hard-working 16-year-old girl 
who has been doing back-breaking labor to support her childhood friend, Sho, as he works to become a star in the music industry. However, all her faith in him is dashed as she overhears him talking about her as a doormat who's only good as his housekeeper. Betrayed and furious, she swears vengeance against him and decides to take him up on his mocking challenge. She'll become a bigger star in the entertainment industry than he could ever be. Perhaps the most important thing I could say about Skip Beat is that even though I just spent a whole paragraph introducing the core plot, I never mentioned the actual male lead of Skip Beat, Ren. That's because the story takes an extremely sharp left turn from the template of more straightforward shows like Boys Over Flowers or female friendship focuses like Sailor Moon. Kyoko's goals operate in this order. Help her friend Momo. Work her way up the entertainment ladder. Take vengeance on her enemies. And eventually, dating Gren works its way up to here, priority four. And that's not 2002 Kyoko. That's like 2012 Kyoko. She took about a decade to warm up to him. Let's put a pin in Haruhi and Kyoko for now. In 2005, Kaicho Wa Maid Sama was published in Lala magazine and introduced its new heroine, Misaki. Misaki is one of the few girls at a newly co-ed high school and is working as the student president to make the campus a more bearable place for the rest of the girls who attend, which has earned her an on-campus reputation as a man-hating demon. On top of that, Misaki also works a part-time job at a maid cafe in order to support her sick mother, her younger sister, and to attempt to cope with the huge amount of debt her absent father has left to hang over the family. That's a huge burden for anyone to handle. But she still has one more burden, an overly persistent customer. Takumi, the male lead of the series, is the school's resident popular kid known for his genius and prodigy at practically everything. He's smart, he's pretty, and he's rich. He's got everything. Everything necessary to harass Misaki at work, that is. An ongoing issue for a large part of the manga is Takumi largely overstepping his boundaries, in some cases getting away with it and in others backtracking, or at least attempting to backtrack as he notices how much genuine distress his latest ploy has caused. The two that are still ingrained in my memory are these. He wins an in-cafe competition to get his picture taken with Misaki and goes as far as to bring the pictures with him to school before realizing how genuinely freaked out Misaki is at the very idea of her potential reputation loss. And then the beach episode. Long after they've started the dating for real, the maid team go to have a promo event on the beach, and on seeing Misaki in a bikini, Takumi gives her a hickey that will force her to wear a t-shirt. This is already annoying, but the real issue is later. Misaki ends up missing out on a hot springs girls night because she's embarrassed about the hickey. Something that's genuinely upsetting to her as she doesn't have many chances to hang out with friends or experience normal high school girl activities. And Takumi does regret this. He does feel bad. And it's not in the long span of terrible things love interests have done to shoujo protagonists. That awful. But it's what made me quit reading it when I was in middle school. The thing is, when your shoujo protagonists become more realized, when they have jobs, goals, aspirations outside of the male lead, everything about the romance becomes worse. The world of the manga is wide enough for them to have other options, but the genre itself isn't wide at all. In 2006, the very next year, Blackbird went into publication. In 2007, Dengeki Daisy followed, and in 2008, Kamisama no Kiss rounded out the trio of what mainstream shoujo would look like when I was getting into the genre. Unfortunately, that meant that shoujo manga was about to look pretty terrible. The male lead of Blackbird, Kyo, ignores the lighter hand of male leads like Takumi, the Oren boys, or the Fruits Basket boys, and turns its head as far back as it's willing to go. Kyo is, in a word, an abusive piece of shit. Dengeki Daisy takes this into a different, yet somehow more unpleasant direction, where the age gap of a 16-year-old girl and a supernatural creature can be, sort of, brushed aside as the realm of fantasy. The male lead of Dengeki Daisy is literally a 24-year-old adult man. 
If he's so consumed with guilt over causing her brother's death, I think he's got far worse things to be consumed with guilt about. Lastly, Kamisama no Kiss does a mix and match for its own unfortunate stew, as Nanami's backstory takes on the awful air of Misaki's and Toru's before that. Left homeless due to her father's gambling debts, she has absolutely nowhere to turn and accepts the male lead's offer to live with him at his shrine. Power imbalance is something that has haunted the shoujo genre since its conception, partially due to the very nature of wish fulfillment. If the fantasy is marry up into wealth, have an inhumanly beautiful supernatural creature fall head over heels for you, or just dating someone you perceive as more hot and talented, then the natural follow-up is that that person will likely have more in-setting power than the protagonist. However, some imbalances go far beyond even the annoying default. Going back to Dengeki Daisy, the fact that he knows she's the one he's texting whereas she has no idea he's Daisy makes an already literally immoral situation somehow even worse as the power imbalance shifts even further onto his side as he simply has more information all the time. In Kamisama no Kiss, Nanami is happy to stay at the shrine, but she's also trapped there. She literally has nowhere to go. She is no more able to leave Tomo and the shrine than Misaki is capable of leaving her job. Poverty has trapped them in such a way that it's physically impossible for them to not interact with their romantic lead. Using poverty as the plot device that forces a shoujo heroine into something is, in some ways, a common sense approach. The heroine is expected to be from a humble background and show their positive qualities of being hardworking and kind in the face of adversity. This is much easier when they can't opt out of the adversity. Toru is actually less tied to this issue than Nanami because in her case, it's clear she has friends she can fall back on. While she would hate to burden them, she doesn't have no one else to turn to. So let's bring Kyoko and Haruhi back into the picture. Inherently, Kyoko is capable of supporting herself. While being in the entertainment industry has forced her into many awkward places, she's got the strongest opt-out option available to her. She's doing it by choice. She takes roles because she wants them. There may be things going on behind the scenes that she doesn't understand, but at any point, should Kyoko decide she can't stand the industry, that Ren or one of her other want-to-be male leads really isn't worth putting up with, she could just get a job doing something else. Haruhi is working from the opposite situation. The entire plot of Oran pivots on Haruhi being poor, too poor to ever work off her debt until Kyoya arbitrarily declares it cleared as per her finishing working for the host club. Nothing in the show could work if Haruhi has an opt-out card because she would just use it and leave. However, despite all of this, the power imbalance, the literal blackmail, the wealth, everything, it doesn't come across as nearly as horrifying as it could be because Haruhi, as a character, is treated with respect and dignity. She has agency, she has the ability to say no to advances, and perhaps most importantly, she doesn't find her circumstances scary. With the exception of one scene where both she and the audience become momentarily, horrifyingly aware of Kyoya's power over her. The beach episode thunder scene, that's right. Lashing out due to feeling vulnerable, Kyoya reaches for the worst way he thinks he could show power over her, skipping from monetary straight to physical. Anyway, I kind of wish rape threats would stop being part and parcel of shoujo anime, but that's certainly not gone anywhere. Now, I've been ungenerous when it comes to the late 2000s. There's another shoujo manga that became wildly successful in the same time period, 2006, and then running all the way to 2017. Kimi Nitsudoke, From Me to You, follows Sawako, a sweet and straightforward girl who struggles to make friends and connect with her crush due to an uncharitable nickname from her classmates and bully. A completely slice-of-life setting, it stands apart from its peers for its gentle tone and slow pace. 
While its tone and male lead may have little resemblance with its peers, the banner that all shoujos unite under is their protagonist. As I mentioned at the beginning of this essay, the ideal shoujo protagonist's circumstances have changed quite a lot over the past decade or so, but her core ideals have not. Humility, hard work, kindness, selflessness. And there are good reasons for this. Shoujo protagonists are expected to be both inspirational and aspirational for the young demographic that reads them. However, in 2013, that idea itself began to be questioned as shoujo magazines stopped being the only available way to access the market. That's right, this was the light novel and web novel boom. Without the need to get a story past an editor, or the need to be in a published magazine that had to pay for printing, an author could shift their protagonist from, will this be inspirational, to will this be appealing? To put it another way, non-inspirational wish fulfillment. For example, the wish to be simply be born with a lot of money. One of the first villainous novels, in fact, one that predates My Next Life as a Villainous, is I Will Live with Humility and Dependability as my motto. Started in 2013, Reika is isekai'd into the body of the villainess of a false shoujo, clearly hugely influenced by boys over flowers. In an attempt to avoid the ruin that came to her and her family due to getting in the way of the male lead, Reika decides to focus all her efforts on being a good person, studying, and saving up money. The fact that this one never managed the mainstream popularity of all of its copycats is probably simply due to the lack of romance. As of the first 200 chapters, Reika simply has never managed to go on a date with anyone. The story is about her school life, and is barely about boys, let alone the reverse harem elements that people would look back to boys over flowers for and bring them into the next generation. The daughter of the house of Albert Wishes for Ruin also follows the elite school no reverse harem pattern. While the Atome game multiple routes now seem to have been baked into the villainous genre, it really wasn't that way from the start. And while the villainous subgenre began to grapple with its own identity, Wolf Girl and Black Prince came into print. Now, with all the further context, was this a good year for shoujo girls to start breaking the mold? To behave selfishly, to lie about things that don't matter, to be constantly worried about her appearance, and to not treat her friends very well. I've seen Erika show up on countless lists of worst shoujo protagonists ever, people putting her right next to Amnesia's blank-eyed and basically silent main character as equally as bad, if not worse. She wasn't well regarded for the same reasons I've just listed. She was a terrible example for young girls. It wasn't a good time for Erika to break the mold and it wasn't a chance to reshape what shoujo could be. But it was a good time for me to see it. The thing is, I think the most important thing a shoujo heroine can be is human. What girls aspire to be, what girls find inspiration in, is finding characters who can echo their own humanity back at them. There's been a lot of new shoujo series since 2013. Monthly Girls Nozaki-kun, a masterpiece, has been running since 2011 and continues into the present right alongside Skip Beat, evolving and adjusting while never losing what made it great over a decade ago. There's a full new isekai saintish genre, where the focus tends to be almost entirely on the beautiful escapism of having a job and a hot night in a fantasy world. The villainous genre may not be as subversive as it likes to pretend, but more genuine and interesting stories are constantly forming from the set pattern of such a templated genre. Perhaps it says something worrying, that change from valuing humble origins and replacing it with the ideal of a heroine born into wealth. But that's not an overall trend in the shoujo market, but a smaller trend in a subgenre. As long as the genre can grow and change, and preserve the flawed humanity of its protagonists. I'm really excited for all the shoujo girls of the future that I'll get to meet. Hi, I'm Zar, and I talk about anime, animation, and storytelling concepts. I've tried doing this video without background music to see if it works better than some of my other videos. So if you've got an opinion on that, tell me. 
With that, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And see ya!